people, people, party, people in the building. What's going on? It's your boy, Mark Thompson, Mark Texan from the Angular team for our Angular live stream. Happy Friday, first stream of the year. Things are going great. Jeremy Elborn just came into the building. Let's add him to Let's see if we can add him to the stream. Uh, Kevin is in the back doing the ones and twos, you know, keeping a party going for us. Uh, things are going uh, so great, so great. Let's see who we got in the building. That's Hassan. What's up, Hassan? How are you doing? All right, we got the most tip. Listen, I know how that feels. Let me add Jeremy. Oh, there's Jeremy right there. Jeremy in the building. Started without me. <laughs> yeah, because I had to go. I had to go. <laughs> I was on time. It's it's on the hour. It's on the hour. No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> you're on the hour. Let's see. We got Nuno. What's going on, Nuno? It's good to see you. Hey, what's going on, Esther? Good to see you. Esther has been uh, coding a lot in Angular lately and uh, been doing some really cool stuff. Uh, super great. Yo, we have Dave in the building. Dave, what's going on? Good to see you, Dave. So good. So good. Luke in the building. Hello, hello to you. Let's go. Let's go. Wiley, what's up? Hey there, Raj. Going good. Okay. Subrata, what's up? Matthew, hello, hello. Matthew, for some reason, in my mind, and this could be completely wrong, I feel like you speak French. I don't know why I think that, but I feel like you speak French. If that's not true, let me know, but I feel like you do. I don't know why. <laughs> Happy New Year to you. Welcome to the party. Uh, it's so good to see everyone. What's going on? What's going on? Hello, hello, hello. What's up, Angular? Dutan, what's up? Hola, uh, Cuba. What's going on? Because you are French. Bonjour, comment ça va? Bienvenue. I speak French. Je parle français un peu. J'ai étudié le français depuis 13 ans, and now I speak mostly Spanish, actually. Um, but I'm working on it for 2025. Maybe I'll, I'll get my French back together. Just with the, uh, <laughs> just with this, je ne parle pas français. Ah, uh, see. The only I know. You don't. I'm sorry. I don't speak <laughs> French. <laughs> yeah. Bonsoir is French. Sufrian. Hello. 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 I know. Bonsoir. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Buenas tardes. Hey. Buenas tardes. I have Bienvenido. Welcome. 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 All right. All right. So many questions. Let me tell you what we're going to do today. Let me tell you. Jeremy and I were thinking about things we could do, and there's something really cool happening in the world of Angular. And we think that we, being the Angular team, I'm speaking on uh on the uh, Angular team side, we think that this is going to help people with a really big issue. Uh, one of the things that we get asked about, Jeremy, when it comes to inputs in Angular, what do you think the number one request is from people? Uh, I mean, specifically, it's probably like observable inputs, right? Observable Long inputs. standing request. Yes. But uh, I, I would say maybe that uh, it's not specifically about observable inputs it's about reactive inputs right that's exactly right that no seriously that's exactly right uh it's about reactive inputs because what people really care about is knowing if the value of the input has changed over time they want a reliable way to be able to react to those things now when you say reactive jeremy what is the thing that we believe is the feature of reactivity for Angular. Why, you you know it signals. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I do, I do, I do. And I'm just trying to hype people up about this because we have an RC coming out about reactive, uh, sorry, not reactive signals, um, <laughs> duh, reactive signals. We have a thing coming out about uh, inputs, signal-based inputs. We got an RC that's available, like a release candidate, and then in the future version of Angular coming soon, we're going to be releasing it. So I thought today that we could just work with the RC and just experiment with it. And we can answer your questions at home about what's going on with signals. And then we can just experiment with the RC. Yeah. How does that sound, friends? We could try out signal inputs. Let's do it. Okay, wait, I see some funny guys. I, I mean, I just wanted to play Celeste, but. <laughs> no, I played it's Celeste on stream already. Remember that? Yeah, and... but well, now I want to play it. All right. Okay. So look, I recently, we'll, we'll... I, I honed. I I originally played Celeste on the Switch, and I did recently picked it up on Steam as well. And now I have to look, clearly I have to replay it again and get all of the achievements again. I find that when I played Celeste, I played it on Google Stadia actually, and I used a Stadia controller, and um, 
I feel like for the precision platforming, you need a good controller. Stadia controller was good, but I felt like I needed like a PlayStation level controller or something like that, something or even Xbox level controller to play. So what would you play it with if you were to play? PS5 controller. PS5 controller, yeah. That's what I'm saying. You need one like a really precision D-pad because that game needs some stuff. Um, Sig puts. Uh, that's pretty funny. I like that. That's what uh, Dave says. Sig puts. That's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, is my screen share showing up in uh, StreamYard, Mark? It may be, but I just locked myself out of my computer because I have hot corners on. <laughs> yeah, turn those off. <laughs> Oh man, hold on. I like what's on my computer. Yeah, I don't like that feature. I like it for when I got to get up at my desk. And you know how we got to be really mindful about security. So I like to swipe to the corner because some keyboards that I have, like I have one keyboard that has a lock. Hold on one second, Jeremy. My microphone is blocking my view. There we go. Now I can see. Uh, I see two screen shares. I don't know which one it is. Two? There's only oh, been... wait. I think it's just this one. Yeah. I'll okay. See. Cool. 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 Um, I yeah, I'm on my laptop, so I'm, but I'll be looking over here, which is where my laptop is. Yeah. I'm streaming on my Windows gaming PC, and I haven't actually like updated my developer environment on this machine in a while, so it's kind of easier for me to use my MacBook over here. Uh, so give me a project name, Mark. What's the what's the project name? Uh, uh, Dave just told us already. Sigputs. S i g p u t s. Yeah, there you go. Six foot. Uh, we always play SAS. Uh, I don't want SSR for this demo. We'll let that go. It needs to install. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I can't change. I can't change. Can't change workspaces now. So I gotta. I gotta pull up the comments on this computer. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. We got a lot of good questions coming in. Let's see. Uh, I like Meta Art Vibration says, you guys are funny, but I like it. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you for acknowledging that we're funny. I don't think that we get enough credit for being a funny team. Um, we really, we're, you know, we have some good energy here. Let's see. What's oh, going on? We got, oh, it finished already. So I'm going to do, do, do. Sick All right. Point. While you're setting up, this is a good question that I don't want it to like drag because I know we get related questions. Um, this one says, "Can we avoid Material Three forever? Can I stay on Material Two for a long time?" Um, so the the update that's forthcoming, right, is not going to just like change the appearance of the components by default to Material Three. Uh, that would be really breaking and really. Uh, not great for anybody who's using those components. So the vast, vast majority of the work that has been going into the components is not actually just updating the CSS to M3. It is changing the components in their internals to use design tokens, which, you know, at, at its simplest form, it's just, uh, you know, hundreds upon hundreds of CSS variables or CSS custom properties that are very granularly configuring the look and feel of the components. And the idea for being able to support the transition to Material 3 is that there is one set of token values that matches the kind of like Material 2 look that they have today. And then you can choose to pass in a Material 3 set of values and that will change the appearance of the app. There, you know, there may be some small style differences on the like M2 side, but we expect that to be pretty minor. And the ch the choice to switch over to GM3 is in your hands, right? You get to decide to pass in those different values. Okay. I'm taking some notes on some things I want us to make sure that we cover with our SIG put examples today because this is really cool stuff. All right, let's see. Uh, oh, man, my connection is all over the shop. I get it. Will this be recorded anywhere? Hey, Ryan, all of our live streams are recorded to our YouTube channel. You can always go back there and then see those. So thanks for the questions. Uh, let's see. We got we got those questions taken care of. Let's see. How to expert with experts. Infinity mirror. Um, how will we use signals perfectly in Angular? I mean, what is perfect? 
What is perfect? Um, oh, hold on. Uh, can you pull my screen share off the? Uh, yes, I sure can. Thing for a second. I have to <laughs> reuse like sign into my JetBrains account. Yeah, so yeah, no, no, protect the, the annual license uh, refresh. So. There you go. No, but so in terms of what are some of the best practices for uh, signals, we're actually working on some brand new guides. So last so last year, I promised you all that I was going to work with the team and we were going to do so much stuff around guides and content. And we've done a ton. Um, there's more coming. And we are so set up to be successful around this. It's ridiculous. We spent a lot of time on infrastructure, spending time to figure out how to make sure that we could set up guides and other things really quickly uh, for developers. And so one of the guys that we're going to be creating is some of the best practices that we know about so far from Signal. So hang in there. Hang in there. Thank you for your question. OK, you can put the uh, the screen share back now. All right. Oh, yeah, but you got to zoom. I'm going yeah, to get there. I'm going to get there. Um, uh, Jeremy, 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 Jeremy. Um, <laughs> Look, I had I had all meetings up until uh, up I until get it. Soon, so. No, I get it. I get it. Um, I I was in meetings a Let's lot see. lately, so totally get it. You had a lot of meetings. That's that's what I think people don't know about <laughs> working at Google is like more than half of my time is just in meetings. I know. And then the one thing I know about Jeremy is how to get him to like do something with me, and so it involves more meetings though. <laughs> so I know it doesn't help. Oh, that, that looks great. Uh, that wasn't the right one. Oh, I was like, I love a good, like a good, like a uh, visible screen. I love it. Here we go. Size uh, 32. All right, there we go. That's big. Uh, and then the last thing I'm going to have to do is um, I'm going to need to change this to uh, the, the latest next release. So um, I want to change that to, what is it? Oh, I would have installed the, the latest, right? Uh, wouldn't that have worked? It, ne it needs to be next, not latest. Oh, next. Yeah, so, I'm sorry. That's what I meant, but like from the command line. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Okay. You like to do it the direct way. I got it. I got it. Let me just replace all this. Why is this complete? Oh, because it's just not installed. Um, and so then we'll run npm install to update that. And it didn't like that. Why didn't it like that? I don't know. I'm just going to go do it on the command line. All right. So while you're doing that, I'm going to uh, ask answer some more questions. I'm new to Angular. I do not like Rx. I think they mean RxJS. Uh, can we use signals only? So, Akash, here's a really important thing to, to consider when you're making a design decision or technical decision with any framework. What is the tool that solves the job that you have or the need that you have? And so in Angular, you have two different needs. You have the need to have reactivity and know when something changes in maybe a synchronous manner. And then you have the need to know when something changes in an asynchronous manner. For your synchronous issues that you want to resolve for, you're going to want to use something like a signal, right? Because it's synchronous in nature. RxJS is excellent for solving for the unpredictable things that could happen. Like mouse clicks are kind of unpredictable. You don't know how many there will be or when they'll happen or if they'll happen at all. Or let's say if you're working with AI nowadays, you get streaming responses. You don't know how many things you're going to get. A signal isn't really great for that because those things are asynchronous and signal is synchronous. You use RxJS for things that are asynchronous. So the world that we're moving into with signals as our reactivity model is that we get to do a much better job of dividing the jobs between what's synchronous, what's asynchronous, what does RxJS really shine, where do, where do signals really shine? Hopefully that helps. All right, I'm going to answer some more questions while Jeremy sorts this thing out. Yeah, um, yeah. What makes a programmer a good programmer? It depends on who you ask. Depends on who you ask. Uh, I'll tell you what I think makes a good programmer. Or I'll tell you what I think makes, let's say, I'll take Jeremy since he's in the room. I'll tell you what I think makes Jeremy a good programmer because I get to work with him and I get to see a lot of his work. 
it's not about like raw like smarts or just like pure skill it's about decision making it's about problem solving and it's about you know the way that you approach problem solving i think that goes a lot further than being able to memorize syntax being able to just know every like syntactic detail of a language or like programming i think it's about really good problem solving and then having really thoughtful approaches to problem solving and when you can do stuff like that, which I think one the people like Jeremy on our team do a really good job on, I think that really helps. Now, how do you get there? I think you get there through practice and experience, though. So it's one thing to just like read books. It's another thing to actually do stuff. And that's the way I feel like you get there. Jeremy, you want to uh, jump in on anything about what makes a programmer a good programmer? Probably being able to install your node modules without <laughs> errors probably makes you a good programmer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what is it talking about? Angular Common 1709. Angular Common RC0 right here. That's why I told you to do it for your command line and just have your whole thing set up to use next. Um, I don't know. It's a it's a big question. Like, what makes someone a good programmer? Right? And there's also like there is a difference between being a programmer and being a software engineer, which mm -hmm. is a nuance that was lost on me early in my career. Right, a, a programmer like. Programming is just one small part of what it means to be a software engineer overall. Um, and I'm I'm more philosophically interested in talking about the like the practice of software engineering than programming itself, even though that is an aspect of it. So if we if we are talking about programming specifically, I think that one of the things I care a lot about with programming is code health, readability, and maintainability. And there is really an art to it. Um, and, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about, like, what constitutes having good taste in programming and what constitutes having a personal sense of style in programming as well, which I think are kind of atypical things to think about. But, you know, I think the, the heart of it is kind of being able to iterate on your approach to a problem multiple times in order to end up with the level of refinement that you're satisfied with, right? I certainly do this when I code is like, I will write something and it will work and it will do what I want. And that is the first part of it. And then the second part is like, which parts of this don't feel the best, which parts mm. feel kind of snaggy or hard to, you know, think about for future people. So I was like, what if I move this behavior over here? What if I break this function into smaller? What if I restructure this, this function instead of having a side effect to be a pure function, right? And kind of iterating on that until you, you feel satisfied with it. Like, I think that is a, a hallmark of someone who's mm -hmm. spent a lot of time programming and is thinking mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. kind of this as an artifact that is going to exist for the long term and not something that is just going to accomplish their immediate goal in the moment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good philosophical. <laughs> this is funny from Paul. Paul says, write code, everything works, add feature, everything broken. <laughs> That's true. And I've worked on code bases like that before. Yeah. Um Oh, wait, you're getting roasted a little bit, Jeremy. We're not a, allowed to use EPM dash, uh, I dash force to install stuff. We know any, okay, let, let's give the disclaimer about what we do on the stream. Like, we kind of just do stuff, right? Like, we're not saying do exactly this unless we explicitly say, like, this is a team like practice. Right now, we just try to make stuff work just like everybody else, right? We're just making it work for now. And it's, it's not telling you this is how you fix this problem. Jeremy is trying the hard path to get this done versus doing the other thing. Hey, it did fix the problem. But I don't he know did what fix it. Here was. So we, on the Angular team, we actually use Yarn for all of our projects. So I don't use NPM, the, like the actual command very often. So I don't know what was up with that. In Yarn, it would have worked. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, all right, we got that. All let's right. See, uh, a, couple of, a couple of things before we j jump, keep going. Let's see. Uh, Nuno says, good programmers don't know everything, but they know where, what and what to look for. That has been a big part of my career is that I remember when I was in the early days, you know, some some of the seniors I worked with, they would get a little frustrated with me because at that time, this is 20 years ago, you know, I didn't understand this point th that you kind of know where to look next versus just kind of being stuck. And like that came with maturity, though, like 
then and also believing that you can solve it, that everything is solvable, right? And then like when I start to learn where to look next, that helped me to become a better engineer and a better like problem solver. Totally. All right, let's see. View JS has very good slot support, which makes working with tables much easier. Does the Angular team know anything about this issue or plan to do anything about it? Oh, you have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea. That's all we can say. No idea so, what we get planned. Uh, so that, this is an area we've talked a lot about. And so one of the things we've talked about on stream before and we've talked about at like ngconf and stuff is that we know there are certain friction points with the component authoring experience in mm -hmm. Angular. And one of those friction points is the feature we call content projection, which is the API that you use with uh, ngContent. Yeah. And it is based on an old outdated version of the Shadow DOM specification circa 2015. So when I first joined the Angular team back in 2015, um, long time ago now, uh, the, there was this hot new Shadow DOM proposal. And at the time, Angular based its content projection on that, which is using CSS selectors yeah. and this... Um, uh, it was a content element at the time, right? So the native element was called a content. And so Angular kind of just ran with that. And then the standards body moved on to another version of the Shadow DOM spec, which got rid of the content element and got rid of using CSS selectors for the slotting and moved to an explicit slot mechanism. So instead of content, it has a slot element and it used the, the slot name attribute to determine what goes into the slots instead of CSS selectors. And so they kind of diverged at that point. And there's also the aspect of this that the content projection in Angular is like, as of today, it is happening, like there's a lot of hats happening at compile time. So it's very static. And so you don't have a lot of capability to do things like you might be able to do in React with the children prop to be able to, you know, make more decisions or conditionally project things at, based on runtime information. And so all of this we know are kind of like limitations or friction points with this mm -hmm. developer experience. And we've talked about like, how could we improve this in the future? And we have a lot of ideas. Um, one of the ideas is modeling the content of a component more as like an ng template, which, which I like to call template fragment, and give the component the ability to choose where to render that stuff um, much more fine-grained. Um, another idea that I'm really interested in exploring further is how to do type checking for content projection. So say, for example, you have a menu component Right now, that menu component is like, yeah, I'm going to put ng content here, and whatever you put inside of me, I'm going to mm -hmm. render it there. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> there's no way to restrict what goes into that. Say, like, oh, this needs to conform to a certain interface, or this needs to, you know, be a specific kind of element. And you know, on Angular, we care very much about being able to express. Uh, your intent in the code. Like, this is the whole point of TypeScript, right? It's like being able to make, to specify in your code the way it should be working, what the API contract is. And like content projection and slotting doesn't really have a way of doing that. So I'm very interested in exploring ways we could say like, hey, I've got this menu component and anything that you put inside of it needs to conform to this like menu item API contract. Um, and that is also nice because it lets you swap out implementations and say like, oh, well, I'm going to bring my own menu item to this and it's fine so long as it's meeting that API contract. Um, so that's also something I'm interested in. So we don't have anything kind of flushed out just yet, right? This is still kind of in the phase where we're like, we know there's friction, we know it could be better. And we're like thinking through all of the mm -hmm. different ideas of like, here's how we can make it better. Here's another way to make it better. And maybe in the next year we will kind of hone in on one particular path forward on that but we're, we're still kind of just in the like figuring out what we want to do phase oh jeremy you know what i was thinking about as you were talking about not knowing i was like wait don't we know when we do a template ref you can do a typed template ref 
if you do like a content child, right? But that's not the same thing. That's the type of the implicit data passed into the inputs, not the type of the elements that are being passed into the template. So, so yeah, if you yeah. use um, ng template, a template fragment, right, mm -hmm. and then you were to use a query to get a reference to that template ref in your mm -hmm. component, that mm -hmm. template ref is a generic type. What does that generic type mean? Mm -hmm. It is the shape of the object that is passed to the template ref right. as its context right. when you call um, create embedded view with that template ref or when, when Angular is rendering it. And the data that is going into that context object is available when you say like, let you know something equals something. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So it lets you like read data from that, which I will also uh, point out is kind of an unintuitive and clunky API for that as well, which is another thing like we know it's kind of clunky and it's unintuitive and we would like to have a better way of dealing with. All right, so let's do something. Let's, let's, let's pivot a little bit. So first I wanna say what's up to Tayamba in the building, what's going on? The streets know you're here, but we got some other celebrities in the building. People, all of y'all are celebrities to me. So I'm grateful that all y'all are here. But I also saw, you know, young child in the building was going on, you know, much love. Uh, I, th I think I saw the, you know, another OG of the OGs. Look at this guy, Brandon Roberts. You know, so we got the Analog JS team people here. We got Brandon and Chava Analog JS rocking with us. Uh, prolific, you know, folks like Matthew in the building. And he says, we want single <laughs> imports. Hey, stop it. Stop it. All right. You know, we know. I want that too. We all want we, that. We all want that. <laughs> yeah, we all want that. So I was on uh, learning with Jason, uh, which is a like a video like stream where you kind of teach people stuff. We're teaching Angular, and that was the thing when I was teaching him how to use Angular. That was the thing that felt because he wanted to do this import, you know, component or not component, but like uh, something from Common Module, right? He just wanted to import from Common Common Module and just use it but like use it almost like a class name, like you do in React. I'm like, no, it's not how that works. Okay. Um, let's let's get to the code. We promised I'll say, I'll say let's code. I was just gonna say that let's code. Right. So, and then we'll get back to more questions, friends. So I'm gonna just start off. We, you know, we'll get like a traditional input here. Um, doo -doo -doo. Let's see, what do we, what do we want to input? Uh, actually, no, let's create another component first, right? We don't want to do this in our root app. Right, component. nope. So nope. let's generate another component, um, which WebStorm should let me do pretty easily. No, do it, just type it by hand and do it fast. Um, I could. Yeah, but... new file and just do it. I like this experience, actually. I like how nice it is to do it. All right, well, we can do that. So yeah. we create new. Uh, touch good file. Let's just call it a uh, boat. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, all right, export class boat. My MacBook is kind of like Dragon today, and I don't know why. I need to probably reboot it. Um, so. uh, hey, Carlos, we're working on signal inputs today. Signal inputs today. Uh, template. We'll just do an inline template for now. Yep, sounds good. Um, and while you're doing that, and you're not naming the component the way I like to be named, I'm going to let that pass. See, uh, this is this is a hot take. I, I, I don't know. know. I agree with me. I would like to remove the guidance from the Angular style guide that says to end your components with component and your services with service and put those things in the file name. We do not use that practice inside of Google, and I find that the result is like shorter, cleaner, and like really like who's confused about like if you have a file called user profile.ts, right? Like you don't need to know that that's a component in the file name. You don't like having component in the class name is not adding anything, right? Why don't I need to know from the file name? That lets me know really quickly. I can know really quickly that it is a component and not something else. Do, do, do. All right, what is this See, that's why it's complaining because yeah. you don't have boat component. Uh, I want standalone. <laughs> see, if I had generated it, it would have done all this for me. I know. I just like, I like people to see that even if you were to like write it by hand, it's only a few lines of code, right? Like people are like, oh, so many lines of code in Angular. It's only a few lines of code to write it by hand. All right. So we'll just put our name here. All right. And then we're going to go to our app again. 
Uh, that's the, the question. Wrong. Which version includes signal inputs? Signal inputs are coming in uh, hopefully 10.1, 17.1. Uh, but you can try it now, and there there's an RC for it. Good question. Why is this on us in the HTML file? I'm just deleting it all. Yeah, get rid of all that stuff. You don't need any of that stuff. Delete yeah. everything. Delete. H1. This. I would delete that HTML file. No, we want a file. We need that. No, a file. I want my component. I want everything in one file. That's Too bad. It. I'm doing it this way. <laughs> Deal with it. <laughs> Uh, Fine, but it, at least Brandon has my back. My user profile component really rolls off the tongue. I agree. Uh, what's up, Lance Finney? Uh, Jeremy, do you know these component? What would you do? Aha, uh -huh. Jeremy, Jeremy knows everything, he doesn't care about, about that. What do I know? <laughs> he says, uh, What would you do if there's a user component and a user service? Name your user service something else, right? Like. It doesn't, all right, this is uh, spicy, right? But like, it doesn't make sense to have a class that's just called user, right? Or user service. What does user service do? Like that, that doesn't tell like user client is better, right? Or like, if you mm. want to be really specific, like you to, user data client, right? Okay. Or user, um, user DAO, like data access object, which I, I don't love. I right? would like, say that's not that far from service though. If but you do user more specific now. But it is very more specific because you could have the user service right. just manipulate users. You wouldn't know what, what that class was doing. I agree service, with you on that. Yeah, yeah. Service is is a, not a useful word because it doesn't tell you what the class yeah. does. Right. Right? right, 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 right. So if you go into the Angular components code base, you will see, like, I this is I have enacted this here when, when I was working on that. Or, like, we don't have classes that end in service. You have things like... Um, Viewport ruler, um, yeah. uh, like uh, overlay is just a service by itself. Uh, I'm blanking on more, but like we don't use service. We always look for a more specific noun that cues specifically what that class does. It's like, what is it responsible for? Yeah. And I think that is a more valuable way to name things. And sometimes it's hard. Yes, that's true. Service is like an easy thing to just reach for. But yeah. ultimately your code is going to be better if you spend the time to think of a more specific name that describes the thing you're doing. And if you can't think of a name that describes the thing and what it's doing, maybe that thing means the thing is doing too much. Ooh. All right, come on, keep coding. <laughs> keep coding. That's a hot take. I like it, uh, but keep coding. All right. Uh, we got a thing here. So, yeah, we got a, I, I have an empty black box. And so we can put a binding here that is just name equals the SS. Uh, Red. Do Shield. not support this, Chow. All uh, right, stop it. He said he's with you. Yeah. All right. So yeah, we got our input there. There it is. Cool. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, zoom in a little bit on that uh, web app, if you could, please. Oh yeah. It's there just you go. perfect. It's an Looks great. Looks great. Uh, here, actually, I like HMS better. The the Her Royal Majesty's Red Shield. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so that's a regular input. You know how they work. Um, we, we're not going to do that. Anymore. Some people do. Inputs allow you to pass values into your component from the, from the template level, right? So in your template, you can pass values down to a component. Every other framework calls this props. Right. <laughs> we call it inputs. Um, you know, I've actually, I've floated the idea to the team of like, what if we just renamed this? What if we renamed it to prop? What if? I don't know. Uh, leave your feelings about that in the chat. <laughs> yeah, let us know what you think. Somebody's going to say, they're uh, going to turn it into React. Oh, yeah. I should have used a self-closing tag. They're right. Man, somebody was mad. Sometimes I forget. We we added that amazing feature. Arthur, uh, so sorry. Let's change this. Let's change it. Uh, no more do we have input, but now we have name equals input. And we're going to import that from Angular Core. Boy. That's it. That's the only change. Wait. We go to. You uh, see what you started? Prop. That? that is too much React. See? We already well, you know, you say React, but like view calls them props, felt calls them props, solid calls them props, right? At, at what point does a term become yeah. so standardized that you, you just go with it, right? And now everybody uses the same term and there's like less deviation that we have to worry about. Yeah. But back to what you're saying, though, I do like this change. I do like that now we have the 
input function, which is that's a factory function, right? Because it returns like an object for is of type writable. No, no, read only input, right? So yeah, the the type on this we can actually like explicitly put here, um, which is going to be uh, input signal right. of string. So you don't have to write that, right? That's um, that's implied. So I'll just like duplicate that and comment it out so that you uh, we want to we want to keep the shortest form here, right? So this is this is implied or inferred by TypeScript, I should say. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And that's it. These two things are equivalent for the most part in terms of the API contract you're defining for the component. So if we go back to our running app, you'll see um, this doesn't this doesn't uh, work, right? We see runtime error here. Um, so why is that? Is because we're not reading the signal. Yep. So this is the the biggest change with like how you actually use this value is now this is a signal, so you have to read the value from it. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, we will probably have a better error message. This is still like this just just landed, so this is still mm -hmm. like very early phases. There's more maturity to gain as we go, but um, we'll read the signal, come back here, and there we go. HMS red shield. So that's all you had to do: change from input decorator to the input function, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and now this works. So if I want to use this here in my control. Um, Wait, slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down. We got some questions. People are asking questions okay. about this. Okay, thing. okay. I have so, more to go through that may answer the questions. But maybe. Answer them. But, you know, I'll, I'll just take five, you know, one small short question. What can be within the input single quotes? That's the initial value yes. of your, of your uh, input. Exactly. So this is the starting value. So if I, let's go ahead and introduce another input without the, the default value, right? So um, let's just say size. We have a size of boat. And that's just going to say input right there. So what is the, the type of this right now? Any mm. guesses? Yeah, what do y'all think? What is the type of line 13? <laughs> All right, I'll hover. Somebody said integer. Um, unknown unknown that's right uh so uh some someone in the chat got it right it is unknown right which is exactly what you want it is unknown you have no idea what could come in here and so in this scenario when there is no default value you would want to explicitly specify a type so this is going to be input signal and we're going to just say for for our sakes uh let's call it a string actually here let's make a little like uh Public enum. No, nah, actually, no, I'm not going to bother with that. It's just a string. <laughs> yeah, just keep going. Yeah. Um, yep. And, uh, oh, actually, no, I am I made a mistake. It's not that. It's input a uh, string there. That's all we need to do. So that that will kind of be the same type here on the left-hand side, but you're explicitly specifying the type there. Wow. So one quick question. I mean, sorry, uh, one moment. Yeah, that's what I meant to do. Again, very new. This is this is actually the first time I'm sitting down to use it now that it is live instead of just like in a dock where we were <laughs> designing it. Joe, alternate is uh, crushing the game right now. Lots of correct insights about how these things work because the input function does accept a generic. That is correct, which is what Jeremy just showed. Nice work. Nice work. Like the energy. All right. So um, let's put something else in our, our template class. Uh, so for, for say, for some reason we want to, um, Ooh, is, like, is it, it's not the union type though for string. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but for size, it's not the union type string or undefined. Um, right, right. So when I say input of string here, the result that I get on the left, uh, that's a good call out is that it is going to be string or undefined, which I know is not the most readable thing here. And the reason for that is because there's no default value. If right. you don't find this it is going to be um, or undefined. So if I were to um, say, I'm going to say here like size class, um, we're going to, let's make it computed. So you, this is also like a thing you can do now with signal inputs, right? So like 
kind of digging into like, what is the value proposition, right? Why would I want to use the signal inputs over mm -hmm. traditional inputs? Well, now we can say, um, I don't know, full size equals a computed. And that is going to be a little expression here. And let's just say we have a template string here. Um, I don't know what to do. So this dot size. And I don't know, we'll just add some other string here, like SC underscore. I don't know. We're just like creating some size string here. And All right, pause here, for one second as you're in the middle. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I'll jump in when you finish. And then we go back over here and we'll see like, oh, SC undefined, right? Because this is undefined. Um, so we'll pop back over to our template here. Let's actually bind something. So that size equals. All right, so as you're doing that, if you go full signals on an app, do you recommend every component property to be a signal? No, don't put every component property to be a signal because if the value of that thing will not change, then why would you make it a signal, right? So that's the thing to ask yourself, will this change? And if it does change, do I care about those changes? You know what I mean? And so that's how you make that decision. Jeremy, anything else to add to that? No, you're exactly right. So any state that is reflected in a template and may change over time, you would want to model as either a signal or a computed. And anything that is static can continue to be a static value. So if I have some actual constant here, which is, let's just say, I don't know. Um, I should have picked an example was easier to do things. <laughs> but, uh, let's say uh, terrain type for, for a boat is always going to be water, right? It's never going to change. So if I say, um, in the, and I say terrain type, that's just, you know, some value and we come over here and, you know, it's there and it doesn't ever need to change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good, 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 good. All right. Um, before we do the next part, can you answer this question at all? Uh, just, I'm so sorry. Uh, will this help improving angular elements? So does anything that we're doing with signals, inputs, et cetera, help improve angular elements? Not in a, in a way that is specific to angular elements. So it, you know, if you are using angular elements to author angular components, then you will be able to benefit from the improvements that sing signals bring in and of themselves in terms of the reactivity and using computed effects and all of that. But there is nothing special about angular elements that will benefit right. from it more than any other type of angular authoring. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Can continue. Continue. Thanks, Mohit, for your patience on getting those questions answered. Uh, and for sync events, you use signals async. Use that's what I'm saying as well. Nuno, uh, is that is it supposed to be Nuno, or are you missing your thing there? Sorry if I'm saying it wrong. But um, and for sync events, you use signals async. Events use observables. Totally right. So it's, that's what I'm saying. Know, it's we want. So right now, RxJS is a strict dependency of Angular. And we've definitely, you know, we've talked about this, uh, again, like on past live streams and in ng-conf talks and in other places. We get about an equal amount of feedback um, from mm -hmm. both sides saying like, hey, I like RxJS and I want it more deeply integrated into the framework. And another side saying like, I find RxJS mm -hmm. confusing and overwhelming and I would like to just not have to deal with it. And so with our approach to signals here, we're really trying to uh, get the best of both worlds by having this kind of reactivity model that plugs very nicely into RxJS for those situations where developers can decide that it is the best fit for what they're trying to do. And also moving like over, this is a very long-term thing, but like slowly over long-term moving to a point where RxJS is optional for Angular. Um, that's not going to happen anytime soon, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We, we want to move in that direction where if you maybe have a small project, you're just getting started, or, you know, you decide the functional reactive programming model is not really for you. Like it's your project, right? You're the best person who is suited to make decisions about it. Um, you can choose not to use RxJS and do whatever else, you know, you want to do kind of for that problem space that RxJS addresses. Um, I think like 
you know, one of the things that I think is often kind of mis, uh, misunderstood is that Angular doesn't, like, it was never really the intent with Angular to say, like, Angular applications should fully and completely embrace RxJS in every way. It was mm -hmm. more kind of incidental that Angular needed its own data structure for kind of modeling streams of events. So the, the perfect example here is like event emitter, right? It represents kind of the stream of events that can happen over time, or mm -hmm. there are things in router or form that represent kind of values over time. And so ArcGIS observables were a convenient way to kind of use as a data structure for that. And, you know, Angular does use ArcGIS internally for, you know, doing some stuff in router and forms and pretty heavily across Angular Material and CDK. And so, you know, it, it's been a useful tool for, for all of those things. But there, there wasn't really this intent baked in from the beginning to say like, ah, yes, an all Angular application should also use RxJS for this. But because the API was there already, the dependency was already there, it was, it's kind of this attractive thing to just like pick up and start using. Um, but again, we, we run into that issue where there's some portion of developers that find that kind of not a, a good fit for their particular use case, or they just don't like that style of programming. Um, there's no one size fits all solutions for anything, right? And so I think the best we can do as framework authors is to give developers the flexibility to compose the solutions that they think are the best fit for their project. Anyway, we get sidetracked a lot. Mm -hmm. um, That's why I was going through questions to make sure that we can get things, but I do want us to spend the rest of the time. So this is what we'll do, friends. We're going to look at your questions. And we're going to try to go through a speed round, maybe in the last 10 minutes and answer. But I do want Jeremy and I to kind of get through more of the coding on this signal. So this stuff is really cool. Yeah. So like that, this is really it on the like the, the signal based inputs. There's also effects, um, right? So if we wanted to, we can like add a little constructor here and say, I just want to do a console.log whenever the, the name changes. How, how would I do that? It's like, ah, well, I can just define an effect here in my constructor. And I'm just going to say console.log uh, this.name. And that's it. This will uh, console.log the name anytime the name changes. And so let's actually go over to browser here. And uh, you can see I have HMS Red Shield. This is not actually something I have that can change right now. So let's change this to a binding so that mm -hmm. it can change. So we're going to, let's just delete that, change that to a binding, go into the the app component here. I'm going to make that an input real quick, maybe, and uh, so you can type it in real time. Well, I'm just going to make a property here that is like sure. boat name equals you know HMS red shield. Um, and then I'm going to uh, put an input and I'll put the value here um, equals to boat name. And then on the input event, we'll say uh, boat name equals a dollar event dot target dot value. Wow. No, I didn't like that, does it? Because it doesn't uh, know what event target is. Yeah. Oh, hold on. Okay. Uh, I'll let you. I, I know what, like, this is. Like, yeah. Right. Simon. Um, Simon LaPointe. What's funny is that I just wrote down on my note for us to make sure we go over this point. So you hang in there. All right. You hang in there. Um, and so the event here is an input event. Um, and we'll say, whoops, event dot uh, target dot about. Way to give away the story, Chow. This is supposed to be a surprise. It's supposed to be a surprise. No, that's cool. Thanks for confirming. I don't think event target can be coming down here. I don't believe you. Oh, we'll do that. <laughs> Uh, sure. No, it's not input event. Like the target should be um, as like HTML input element. I know that it is. So there's that. 
Um, I, the developer, know this, and so I'm using this cast. Um, so come back here. Um, I don't know why this is trying to, why this is inferring event instead of input event. It should know that this is an input. So I don't know what's going on here. I'm going to just say like um, dollar any right now because I don't, I don't want to figure this out on stream. But that'll solve that. And then we'll just say boat name here. So that was um, that. And oh, that's a, you know what? You could save yourself some coding too, Jeremy. What? Uh, Dave just brought this up. You can just use a template variable right there. So you can, there's a, there's a catch, right? So if I, if I do this, um, if I say, um, let's just say field, right? And I come over here and I say field dot. Oh no, not there. Just in your input name equals input dot value. You see what I'm saying? And you're on line three. Uh, so this that is that is what I'm doing, right? Like I can create a template variable here that'll get this right. field, and then mm -hmm. I can reference it here. That won't update unless I have an input event defined here. Like I right? No, 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 no. I'm with you on that. I'm saying put the input event just to be your boat name equals input that value on line three, not down on line six. Uh, I don't understand what you're saying. Hold on. Uh, anyway, like, I don't want to get bogged down on this. Yeah, this yeah, is yeah, sure, stuff sure. that we're, we're showing off. So we're going to leave that as is. Um, I, I don't know why this is complaining. What does it say? Property name. Yes, it is. It's right there. It's name. Um, I, this is maybe just like IDEs haven't, uh, haven't been updated for this yet. WebStorm probably hasn't been updated for this. So it doesn't know that, that input. But you can do there. that. Um, again, very new, very new. <laughs> Still in, uh, still even in the next release. Uh, but so now when we come here, if I change that, like we can see that changing and you can see in my console here, it is logging every time that that changes. So clear that, HMS something else. And so the, the real like nice thing here is that this um, effect just by reading the value creates the relationship between the effect and the signal that you're reading so that Angular knows whenever this value changes, the effect should run. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, I, I'm biased here because <laughs> this is the, kind of the intent of this, but it makes it much easier to set up things that you want to do when something changes. And mm -hmm. computed's really, like, computed's are the real, like, the, the real victory here is that they might get much easier to express this kind of computed state compared to what we have today with kind of ng on changes and imperatively setting up those relationships. Um, yeah. You may also be wondering like, hey, doesn't the input decorator have a bunch of options? Yes, it does. Those options are also all still available on hey, the Doug. input function. So this takes a config object here. Um, so we can pass in, for example, an alias, which I'll say size. Um, what is this complaining about? Not assign one to parameter of type string. Um, let's just go look at this signature here. Mm -hmm. um, oh, right, because the first value is the default, right? So if I want to pass options. Hey, the second thing, yeah. Too bad TypeScript doesn't have name parameters. That's one thing I did love about Dart. Um, so we can pass here. Uh, we would say undefined as the default value, and then this param. So like alias, and I'll just like use the same thing. But if you wanted to, oh, oh right, because I have string or undefined. Right, right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, if I'm going to explicitly pass mm -hmm. undefined as a value, it needs to be in that. Um, mm -hmm. But we can say. We can say alias here. We can have transforms. So we can have whatever like input transform to transform the value. I won't bother writing one of those out. And if we want to have a required input, uh, all we do is say input dot required right there. Nice. Um, the reason that required is part of the function signature part like the like it's using a different function rather than a config object is because the signature gets really weird if you try to make required an option 
in terms of inferring what the type of that signal is as it interacts with the default value, right? So it doesn't make sense to say, like, I have a required input that has a default value because you know that default value is always going to be overridden. So... Okay, wait, slow down for a second. <laughs> Lock here. What I know, this is a lot of. Oh, hopefully, you're replying to all the magic that you're seeing on screen. All these like new, like uh, reactive based inputs, right? Yeah. Um, like so the like reason, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Let me. I'll, I'll say it again. The reason required works like this instead of being an option is because for required inputs, there's no default value, right? So if I like pop up my autocomplete here. Like the thing that this is expecting here, actually just go to the definition for input dot required. You'll see the first argument is the options because it doesn't make sense to have a default value for a required input because the user of this component or directive is required to specify that input value. So your default value would always be overwritten. So because of that, the parameters for required inputs are different. It's only just the options here, right? For like alias and transform, and and yes, like transform is all is still an option here, just like it is with the the decorators. Dave just asked that question, but there you go, you just showed it. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you just answered this about the rationale for making optional the default and not required. <sighs> It could go either way. We think that most inputs in most of the time are optional. Um, it's hard to measure data on this, right? We, obviously, like we can look at all of the code in Google and say, like, what's more common, optional inputs or required inputs? Yeah. But required inputs were only introduced recent, recently. And so there's a massive wealth of components out there that are not. Uh, that were written before there were required inputs. So it's not really a representative thing. And looking at other web frameworks, right? We, we see that like optional, like props being optional is I think the more common thing. So it's, it's also like, it's less breaking, right? Like going from the original input to the like signal-based inputs, having them not be required is kind of the like, that's consistent with what it was before. And in general, we don't want to like, we want to minimize the distance between the pre-signal stuff, the zone-based change detection and the signal-based things in order to reduce the amount of barriers for people to switch existing code to take advantage of signals. Um, it's also worth mentioning that um, these two things work completely side by side. So if I, I'm gonna like, let's just change this to size real quick. I can change this back to, um, I can change this back to the decorator. And these two things, I'll just like do that for readability. These two things work together in the same component, no problem. You don't have to switch all of them at once. Mm -hmm. So I, I can even go back here and, all oh, right, I do have to change this to calling it to just right. the value. But um, I can come back here and those, those work again just fine. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in real quick, Jeremy. Uh, it's, Shane Lu says, uh, it seems that string undefined contradicts input required. Are you missing something? Yes, you are missing oh. a little bit of context. He so. provided a default value of undefined to the required uh, input, which meant that we had to stretch the type to be the union type of string and undefined because he specifically wrote undefined as a default value for part of the example and then yeah. he changed the code back. That's yeah, so that, that just kind of was an artifact of me me editing it to show it off. Um, so if I were to say just string here, this means someone is required to pass in a string and we know that this is always a string. If you try to read this input before it is set, Angular will actually throw an error. And so it can't be undefined. Whereas with Angular today and the input decorator, if you did learn, if you did try to read an input before like on an it, you would get an undefined value even if it, that wasn't included in your type. So this is safer from a type perspective and is much, it, it is fully compatible with TypeScript's strict property initialization strictness check, which is really nice. And um, if I were to include undefined here, what this means is that whoever is using this component can pass undefined in as a value and that is acceptable. 
Right. But it's still required that they got to be explicit with the undefined value then if they're going to say undefined. Okay. Uh, Bull X Trader says, what's the quickest way to learn Angular for beginners, guys? Oh, um, she's typed in all caps. Go to angular.dev. The tutorial on angular.dev. Angular.dev. We got still two. in beta. Still in beta. So it's but, not uh, not indexed on Google search yet. <laughs> but those tutorials are are crisp. They might be in beta, but they are crispy. And you're gonna learn a lot. And if, if you like the way we teach, you're gonna love it. I'm uh, really gonna love it. Okay. Um, let's see. Good question. This this is a good question. Let's see if we can do just a couple of like like rapid fire. Uh, uh yeah. last question. Great question. Yeah. That's a great question. Are signal inputs available before ng on init? No. NG on init still means the same thing that it's always meant, which is that your input values are available. And that is true both you know, with or without signal-based inputs. There is a point in time in the life cycle of the application or the life cycle of a component at which the input values are known. And that point is still NG on init. And so if you try to read a signal input before NG on init, it now will throw an error. And that is better. That is the behavior you want. Because if you try to read it before then, the value you're getting is like, it's just wrong. And like, if you have, for example, a required input and you were to try to read that before ng on init when the value is set, you would get undefined. And that's wrong, right? That wouldn't be reflected in the, the type information. So now with this new behavior, it's much more correct and much less possible to like, give you a, a, an error that should have been caught by the type system at build time. All right, I want you to do a couple of things before we run, Jeremy. Um, you got any more time or you got to go? Oh, I got I got time. All right, I want you to code a couple more things. Okay, <laughs> so we did both decorators. We did reference the input in the template, which was a thing that I'm glad you showed. Uh, can you, let's mutate uh, input. Mutate, uh, an in, oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, mm -hmm. so yeah, let's go ahead and attempt to um, do a little, let's put a little button in here. Uh, let's just say mutate, and we're going to add a little click handler there, and we'll just call that function mutate name. And let's go ahead and generate that. Thank you, WebStorm. Oh, no, wait, not like that. Um, <laughs> yeah. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh, this dot name, and I want to change it. So, you know, it's a signal, right? I should just be able to say like dot set, and let's just say this dot name. Um, plus xxx. Hmm, that's giving me some some squiggles here. Um, no, not name. Uh, that's not a signal. I'm gonna change this back to a signal. <laughs> yeah, make it a signal. There you go. Um, input. But so yeah, name dot set does not exist on input signal. Well, why isn't this a signal? Well. Yes and no, this is giving you of type input signal. Input signals are read only. This is somewhat of a dramatic change from the way inputs worked before, where they were just regular properties that you could write into. And we believe that making inputs read only like this is a much like healthier way of, of dealing with that. And if you do want to kind of do something like this, what I'm saying here, the preferred way of doing that with signals would be to create a computed that is, you know, something like this dot modified name or something like that is equal to a, you know, this is not going to go here, but. Um, yeah, put it in the right place so that people can. Put it in the right place, like yeah. modified name equals uh, computed of um doo -doo -doo. say like this dot name plus uh xxx right that's the way you would want to model something like that and so with this way like you always know like there is this source of truth for like what the input value that is actually bound into you you know what is always bound and it makes like what is the ownership of this piece of state very clear now, we are working on another API that is in uh, in the design phase now called model inputs, which mm. are writable and will be used for two-way binding. 
because that is a concept that you know exists today and we need to make sure that that's covered in signal based inputs as well so stay tuned for a future stream where we will talk about model inputs once those are are ready to try out leave leave a little cliffhanger for for next time yeah you did input alias you said read only okay those are the main things that i want to do because uh just in general when i think about the way we've been oh jeremy okay this this is gonna be a, a coding challenge for you real quick let's do something let's add routing to the app real quick so <sighs> add routing yeah because i want you to do one thing to show one more example of this. It's going to take like the rest of our time. <laughs> no, it's going to take five minutes. I, I know how to add writing with the back of my hand. No worry. And you know how to do it too. We'll do it fast. Let's go to yeah. app.config. Let's do it. Um. All right. App.config. Um, oh, no. It already has routing. Oh, and boom. I and routing when I what does your config say? Um. What do you mean? Like my, my config. Yeah. My okay. Config. Cool. 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 So then when you provide your router, can you also provide uh, with... It's like with input binding, with component input binding. Is that it? Uh, component where exactly this with input with component input binding. Mm -hmm. Right. Like and so let's make a route real quick that could take just any like a just a placeholder variable and show how to link that to an input signal. I mean, it's this. Spoiler alert, it's the same as non-signal inputs. It works exactly the same. I know way. it works the same, but I just want to see it. <laughs> I get it. I know we're out of time. Let's see. Resolvers can pass data inputs best feature. Well, we're not we're not out of time. We we can we can go a little bit more, but uh, all right, let's go to like routes. Uh like I've never done this before. So Yeah, me neither. That's why I want to do it because this I gotta, like, friends, routes. friends at home. As we're doing this, we're experimenting with it because we this is brand new stuff like right out the box. So if we don't know how to do it right, don't be like, man, the Angular team don't know how to write code, blah, blah, blah. Like, eh, stop it. I mean, I don't code as far as, I, I code very little like actively anymore. Well, like I mentioned at the top of the stream, new. meetings. <laughs> yeah, I just want to have some fun and try some new stuff because I like trying our new features, even if it means trying on, on air. These streams are the, like the most coding I do in general. Although, yeah. like, you know, well, I you did, I did get my hands dirty a little bit uh, in Q4 with some that API documentation. Yeah. Stuff. And plus, you do a lot of, you know, thought leadership for us and stuff, man. We, we all know how you're living in these streets. It's fine. I just want to let everybody else know, don't be coming at us if they have any questions about what we're doing. Man, I like Barry. Like, yep. And we need to, we, like, comp we need path and then a component. Path. That's, that was the thing I couldn't remember. Let's, let's say, like, home... And component is both. <laughs> sure. Totally and fine. Here, I'm going to like path. Also, boat is a component. That also goes to component boat. No. Wait, make no. the first one go to app component or something. You're going to uh, make me make another component? <laughs> no. Okay. So look, make another component. You can use your generator this time to, to save us some time. All right. I don't know. Export class um, tank. I don't know. There you go. A tank, um, helicopter. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Brandon said, uh, boat component component. Um, but you know, we got to run with that. That's pretty funny. Template. Yeah, see, people, people are doing... excited. They want to know if we, can, if we can do it. Yeah. You know, uh, let's just have some fun. Um, <laughs> Jeremy, do it, do it, do it. <laughs> Uh, somebody asked a question about what am I going to make another video course? Oh, here it is. Ed asks, Mark, will you create another video tutorial on V17? Uh, I'm actually having conversations with our team right now about um, the update to the course because, you know, it's about time. It's time for, you know, some new new course or updated course content. But here's the challenge, friends, and I want you to let us know this. Do you want an updated V17 tutorial course like introduction course or do you want us to spend time on building a more advanced or intermediate course see aha uh -huh. see that's that's where it gets a little tricky where should we spend our time you let us know what you think all right and so now we need a route param so uh like slash name like that is that how it goes Okay, let's see. I got a question. Let's see. Uh, yes, that's right. That's how it goes. And then 
we're gonna Hold say on, let's see what oh just saying will you go over any angle ssr in the stream the question on working in injected requirement object server side in dev mode uh if you want to do some so so do this i don't uh know this answer right off hand um Angular SSR, so something about the injected. Uh, can you, OJS, are you happen to be on Twitter? Can you ask this question on Twitter to the official Angular account? And then I'll work with our team to uh, see if we can get you some type of some type of help. Like we can maybe reply the people who worked on this thing. Cause I don't know the answer to this. Jeremy, do you know the answer about anything about injected requirement object object server in dev mode? Uh, that sounds a little bit too specific. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's too hard to answer on the fly, but let's. Yeah. Uh, in in general, I think we when we're on stream, right, we can't really like get into like, well, let's debug this specific issue you're having in your code base because it's not really a uh, the the best avenue for it. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit harder. Um, I will show this on my live stream. Great, I love that, Dave. I'm gonna go on Dave Dave's live stream soon too. So uh, if you like hanging out with us. You could do that. Um, yeah. So I did the thing you wanted, Mark. It's done. You I did put, it. I put a route param here, and that's yeah. all connected to the input. That has yeah. nothing to do with signal inputs. That works either way. I know, but, but show the code on how you made it work. Show the configuration. See, this is a thing where we have yeah. to dispel the fears of like learners who are learning something new to let them know the things that they feel comfortable with still work. So yeah. we know it works, but let's just show them. So you still got your... Your, your placeholder, which is fantastic. Yeah. So this is this just this name here matches the name of the input over in in boat, which is name. And so it automatically binds that route param into the input. But you know what's cleaner about this is that all of our previous examples with decorators, we were using setters to do this and some of the previous examples with a decorator format. So this is so nice. Look how nice that is. Well, this this works with like if I come this back out right and go back to to that, like get rid of that. Like that works exactly the same way. Uh, what's this? Yeah. yeah. Let's see. Yeah. I don't know We're why exactly it wasn't working before. I don't know. I saw a bunch of examples where we were using setters, and I'm like, I don't know why we had to do that. I thought we had to, but um, yeah. I'm glad we don't. That's even better. But still. So, for instance, if you saw the code change, there were, there was no change for you, right? As a developer, as long as you use the with input, with component input binding in your configuration with your provider, and you name the things that match. If your input parameter matches and your input itself, whether it be a decorator input or signal input, it just works out of the box. This is a nice experience, Jeremy. I'm telling you, this is a nice experience. So, thank you for showing that. Yeah. What happens? What happens if I put an alias on it? So Ooh, there you go. Now I want you to start base. cooking. Right. If I put an alias here and say this is nombre, does that still work? It doesn't. So you have to you have to match the uh, you, gotta, you gotta match the alias. You gotta match the alias. Let's go. If you, if you add an alias, that's the thing it will use. Oh, uh, let's see. Uh RM says, Mark, please let us watch someone migrate Tour of Heroes live to SSR, to SSR live. I think migrating Tour of Heroes to modern Angular live could be like a fun project that we could do. I think uh, Dave, one of our GDE, says he's going to do this on his stream. So you can get somebody to do that soon. Uh, Dave, drop the link to your stream or your YouTube channel uh, so we can make sure we highlight it if you said you're going to do this. Is that what you said? Because I heard you say you, you could do it on my stream. So if that's what you're going to do, let the people know so they can support you. All right. It I looks like people like do want to um, intermediate stream. course. <laughs> you said what? I feel like that would be a long stream. Yeah, but it'd be fun, though. Let's see. Wait a minute. I guess Mark meant react to that input later. I don't know. What did I mean? Did I say something? It's a pun. Oh. <laughs> I don't know what I'd be saying. React to. Oh yeah. Mm -mm. Uh, let's see. Let's see what this says. This is both introductory and advanced courses would be nice because many people who aren't interested in Angular are are now. I agree to that. We've gotten so many people. You know what's wild? Just to show you how like Angular's momentum is super real. Our stream used to average about what like forty people, Jeremy. Well, yeah, we gotta we gotta build an audience over time. Yeah, but now we got like two hundred people right now watching our stream. 
They've been watching for this whole. We've averaged two hundred people today. That's fantastic. I'm yeah. so grateful that people want to come and hang out with us. Thank yeah. you for that. I'm kind of curious too, though. Like, what if uh, I'm? You can say in the chat, like, would people be interested in more stuff like this? Like, if Mark and I streamed in like the evenings and we just played games with no coding, like, people still interested in that? I don't know. I could talk about a lot of things off the cuff, but yeah. Yeah, what, what do you what do you want from us? You tell us what you want. You want us to play games? Do you want us to like code? What do you want? Yeah. See, I'm not gonna code in my evenings, right? But I got right. I, got, I got a game backlog. Yeah. Okay. So people are saying yes, but yes to what? Every day. <laughs> um. Sorry, my uh, kid just like walked in. I was just like, get out of here. You do not go on camera. <laughs> Yeah, you should get one of those like on air lights for your uh, for your setup. Yeah, so people know not to come in. Coding. Wait, listen to this. Coding games. Coding every day. Never. Uh, sorry, uh, streaming every day. Never. But coding games. Uh, we used to do that. We actually used to do that in the beginning, and we that was fun. But that was the most stressful streams I ever participated in. Trying to code a game that we would just make up a game. Uh, that's pretty fun. Okay. So simple, like simple web -based, based games, right? Like we could do that, right? We can make like a Wordle clone or like a oh, sure. clone or something like that. But it, but I want to, you know what I want to bring to life, Jeremy? Remember that board game maker that I was trying to make in Angular? <laughs> now I understand so much more about Angular that I can do it, I think. So maybe yeah. I'll try it again. I don't think your problem there is with Angular. I think you you need a uh, a very detailed design of what a board game game engine <laughs> actually. I is. know, but the, so here's what was was sticking me in that. At that time, so this was like almost two years ago, we did this stream. I didn't know as much about like our content projection and then our like dynamic template stuff. So those things have improved. Not what well, haven't improved, but like my understanding of those things have grown pretty significantly since then. And I'm like, okay, that could help me get to where we're trying to go. Yeah. So. Also, I see Aeneas was here in the chat. It's like, I want to see Jeremy phrase Svelte on the Angular channel. I've done that before. I love Svelte. I think Svelte is great. What's up, Aeneas? What's going on? Yeah. Okay, I believe in this, though, Kohea. Uh, work on a real more complex app over time. I actually agree to this. Here's the hard part. When you think about the infrastructure required to make a real complex app, the first thing you probably think about is, like, login, right? So do we do, like... A Firebase like tutorial, and then that's less Angular, and that becomes more about Firebase, right? If we use Firebase as our login platform, and like, what about your data? You see what I'm saying? So it's harder to make one of these examples without including other products that kind of takes the attention away from what we're trying to focus on, which is teaching Angular or coding Angular. Yeah, you you very quickly get bogged down in something like that. Of like, you know, say like we we decided to make our own. Uh, like calendar app or something like that, right? Like mm -hmm. some more like appointment viewer or whatever. Like you very quickly get bogged down in like figuring out the product <laughs> questions mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than actually just focusing on, you know, so, like something like Angular, right? Uh, and it we, we would end up spending more time on that than I think would be useful for us. <laughs> right. We, well, you know what? I'm going to commit to this. We'll try one stream this year where we, we go down this path. Maybe I'll just, we'll just smooth out some of the other things beforehand and then focus only on air on like the building of the features maybe. But I'll have to do that because Jeremy is super busy. So I would have to find time to do that work. And so, you know, um, this is nice. I could watch you guys play Minesweeper. These conversations are really great. Thank you for that. And Jeremy built Minesweeper uh, one time. Yeah, that was the only game we finished. <laughs> that was the only game. Well, no, we got pretty close on Uno. Remember I made Uno? And we got pretty close on Uno. We we made it so that you could drag cards into the thing. Yeah, that was pretty good. Play. That was pretty good. We got, far, we got pretty far on spades. What we didn't get on spades was actually like the, the AI playing anything. Because we argued too much about the naming of what a, a trick versus a book was. We spent more time like trying to figure that out. You you argued. <laughs> I did because I'm like, what's a book? <laughs> and I what's a trick? I was like, what's a trick? Get out of here. All right, friends. Look, I, I think we're at the end. I think Jeremy and I are uh, we're going to probably call this one. But uh, we saw some really good feedback. Some things like do some open source libraries, try Angular Libs, give ideas what to improve. This is a little hard, but maybe we could 
showcase maybe some open source like contribution stuff. You know, just look at stuff. So people ask us, like, example, what do we think about like analog and what they're doing? I think what people are doing in the community, I honestly think that people are doing some very cool stuff. And what's more important about what I think I think and what maybe Jeremy thinks and what the same things we think that the fact that the community is so engaged is the most amazing part. The fact that people are trying to push the boundaries and create things that is amazing. And that just shows us that we're giving you the tools that you need to express yourselves. And that feels really good. At least that's from my side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, let's see anything else. Jeremy love the background. Such yeah. rich colors and contrast. That, that's my house. <laughs> <laughs> Although in within a few months, I'm going to be moving my setup here down into the basement instead of being up here. So can't wait to see it. I, I, I've been thinking about. I was talking to my to my wife about this, like doing like a live stream studio for myself. But I need to get somebody to uh, run a hard line to this little like corner room in, that I have that's available. Mm -hmm. But I want to like live stream with the same setup that I use for my like motivational videos that I make. And so, you know, let's see what that looks like. But we'll see. All right. All right. All right. All right. Enough. 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 I think we're uh, OK. Ah, last question. Because I like Lars so much and Lars has been such a fervent supporter of our stream. We, we, we can take one more question before we call it, because uh, we also we might lose Kevin. He has other work he has to do as well. Um, he's in the background helping us out. Uh, talk briefly about the new provide zone. Let's change the text in Jeremy. I'll let you take that one. Uh, is that in a PR? <laughs> so, so I know Andrew is working on like, you know, chopping down all of the, the trees that are blocking us from having like real zoneless applications and making zones something that you kind of opt into rather than um, it just being the default. I don't know exactly where we are in the like the APIs. And so if this is a specific provider that's proposed somewhere that I, I haven't seen it just yet. Um, mm -hmm. But I will say like, yes, obviously we, we have this goal of being able to have like, we want to move towards a world where zoneless applications are the default. And so we're, you know, making lots of baby steps towards that. And remember that for people, because we are making changes. And I, I think it's, we just got to be super clear about this. The way that we work, we try to bring everybody along with us. So even if we're making zones optional, we understand that there are millions of lines of code that still rely on zone-based reactivity, zone-based components, et cetera. So we will do our best to continue to support those people, right? Like we're not gonna just like do zoneless and then your applications no longer work or optional zones, right? Like just keep that in mind. We gotta tell the streets, Jeremy, because you know that people watch our streams and then they write about what we say. So we gotta be super yeah. clear. <laughs> yeah. and we're not gonna leave everybody. Uh... Oh man, see, look, it's already, already uh, available in the latest build with this uh well no that's not available that if you notice the barred latin o on the on the symbol that means it's a private internal uh api mm -hmm. that is not for not for public consumption but <laughs> mm -hmm. if you are uh if you are the adventurous sort it is uh it is something that uh you know exists to like it's not meant to to be a public API or supported. So, like, yeah. Wait a minute. I got to say one last thing because I know I'm, I'm trying to wrap the stream, but I got to say one last thing about this. Zone JS. I do not think it was a mistake, and let me tell you why. Let me tell you the vision that I received by using Angular for the first time, like Angular after Angular JS, just Angular. I started writing a component. And then I started changing my properties of the component. And then the screen started updating and refreshing without any manual intervention. No sets, no set state, none of that stuff. So from a developer experience, when you get started, that is a really smooth and good experience. What we found over time, though, is that at scale, it became problematic. So I don't like the characterization that it was necessarily a mistake more so that we just found out that we outgrew it being our primary way for reactivity as we want to build very large scalable applications.
Yeah, so I think definitely if you go and watch the ng-conf talk that Alex or Cabal and I gave a couple of years ago called Angular and Design Review 10 years later, the, the main takeaway is that, you know, every solution has a set of trade-offs and there's no, you know, one size fits all solution, right? Everything is just trade-offs for like goods and bads. And what we found over the course of time is that the solution, like like Zone.js, kind of this automatic change detection that's based on like this global top-down change detection model, right? It has certain trade-offs, right? There are good parts of it, right? There are parts where like you just don't have to worry about your state management. You use raw properties and you just edit them and they work. And a lot of people really like that, but it comes at a cost. And we've seen that over time that cost kind of becomes an issue once you reach a certain scale or once you reach a certain complexity. And we want to be able to support those kinds of apps that are very large scale and are very complex. And so that is a huge part of the motivation for kind of the signal-based reactivity in order to address those challenges in you know, scaling applications and being able to make maintainable and performant code bases at that size. Yeah, very, very, very true. Uh, okay, friends, listen, this has been a really fun one. We did a lot of chatting. We did some coding. You all gave us a lot of feedback. I'm going to go through these comments and uh, see what lessons we can learn to continue to improve this stream. I think we're getting better and better. Jeremy, I think the days of us just playing video games and chatting are going to be like very like low now. No, Unless I'm still gonna do it. I'm still going to do it. <laughs> I mean, another thing we can do is this, Jeremy. We can do like a second stream that is like way less questions, way less talking, and just like video game and just playing a game, like yeah. hanging out and playing a game. I will say too, like I see some stuff in the chat of like, ah, like any of the team likes spell. Well, if you've if you've been watching us for a while, you know Mark and I's philosophy is that everything is good, right? Everything is good. Like if you if you come to us and say, like, hey, like what's better? Re like React or Vue, and like both are good, right? But like there's no one size fits all solution for everything. Everybody is doing really great work in the web community. We love that we have this thriving ecosystem with lots of different solutions for different use cases with different style preferences. And so, you know, we, we love Angular. We work on Angular. We want to make that a great solution for as many developers as we can. But all of the other solutions are great too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here's something else that's great. That last stream made me buy that alligator game. You see that? So there has to be some gaming in our stream. I know y'all like code and, and we are going to support you all with coding, yeah. <laughs> but we are going to do some more gaming though. Um, maybe I'll play the game that me and my kid are making. We're making a, a game called Ultra Fighters. And yeah. uh, <laughs> it's his name. My kid is deciding, he's designing everything. Uh, there's just so many parts to this game that he doesn't understand how much work it is. And I'm like, pal, we, look, if we get this, these pixels on the screen and get them to jump, that is a win. And he's like, but no, dad, we got to have, and he's only six. So he's like, but dad, do you blah, 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 blah. You know what I mean? Like, and I was just like, buddy, like you have no idea. That, that, that's like a four year project. If we do what you're saying, let's just get something on the screen, right? Let's just do that. So maybe we'll, we'll play that game. All right, friends. Thanks so much, uh, Jeremy. Thank you for being a part of everything. Thank you, friends in the community. Also, big shout out to Kevin Callanan in the building, always supporting us, commenting, supporting, moderating, all that kind of good stuff. It is always fantastic to have you. And listen, friends, no matter what you are doing, what you're doing it with, do us a favor and go build great apps. We'll see you the next time. Peace. <laughs>